Norma Walton caught the real estate bug early. My dad's an engineer, my mom has interior design skills, and so they were really good at buying a house, fixing it up, living there for a few years, selling it for profit, and buying something else. They have an acumen with improving real estate that I think I probably imbibed from them just growing up in that household. And even though she trained as a family lawyer, Norma and her husband soon found themselves deeply invested in the Toronto property market. The first piece of real estate we purchased was an office on Mount Pleasant where we could run our law practice. And then the second purchase was a house. Soon they bought two more properties in Toronto's posh Yorkville neighborhood. Over a year, we fixed them up, severed them, tenanted them, and ended up making a million dollars in cash in one year. So it was, it was very cool. It snowballed from there. Soon, they were making such good money flipping houses, they both left their legal careers. You would find a problem property, you would fix it, you would refinance it, and you would do it again. It was an easy model to do, repeat, do, repeat, do, repeat. And that, it allowed us to grow very, very quickly. So from 2001 through to 2010, I think we owned 28 properties and we sold 19 of them and we kept nine of them at that point. They called their company the Rose and Thistle Group. They bought commercial properties throughout central Toronto, just as the real estate market was heating up. It wasn't long before Norma and her family had bought themselves a home in Toronto's most exclusive neighborhood, the Bridal Path. The Bridal Path is where the wealthy and the famous live. Conrad Black, Celine Dion, Prince had a house there for a long time, and it's where Drake has built his lavish new mansion. I think for a lot of Canadians, it symbolizes the height of success. You, you live on the bridal path. You must be one of Canada's most successful people, or one of the world's most successful people. If you were to walk through the neighborhood, which I don't advise because there are no sidewalks, here's what you'd see. Very large fences and very large walls you will likely not be able to see into most of the newer homes. Some of the older homes have fences that you can sort of peer through, but it's like every property is like a park. Every property is a minimum of two acres. In Toronto, that's unheard of. And Norma admits that living on the bridal path sometimes went to her head. There's definitely an arrogance and, and it's not good for you at all. Norma Walton no longer lives on the bridal path. In hindsight, if I had the ability to move back, would I? Absolutely not. It's it's not the neighborhood for me. It truly is a neighborhood for celebrities, titans of industry, and really old money. People who want and need, frankly, the privacy. But even if she wanted to, Norma couldn't move back to the bridal path. Her real estate business is shut down. That's because Norma Walton has been convicted and sentenced for stealing over a million dollars from her business partner. I will tell you that the criminal case is currently under appeal, and I am hopeful that the two convictions will be quashed and acquittals replaced. Canadian real estate is one of the most lucrative games around. And when there's that much money to be made, criminals are never far behind. Canada is addicted to real estate. For many people, it's become the only path to build wealth, and it's become the biggest industry in the country, bigger than oil or dairy or mining. For some Canadians, real estate has become a kind of a habit. Why invest in a career doing anything else when you can make more money buying and selling property? But everyone needs a place to live. And when real estate becomes a game for people who have the means to play, the stakes for the rest of us become unbearably high. In the coming season, we'll investigate the roots and consequences of Canada's real estate dependency. I'm Arshi Mann, and from Canada Land, this is Commons.
For most of us, we think about real estate as a mechanism for finding a roof over our heads. Whether you rent or you're paying a mortgage, the property market is just a way to have a decent place to live. But of course, where you live is the ultimate indicator of your status. There are neighborhoods in this country that few of us will ever even visit, let alone have an opportunity to live in. The British properties in West Vancouver, Upper Westmount, Montreal, Rothsay in New Brunswick, and in Toronto, that place is the bridal path. For decades, pride of place for the most prestigious residential street in Canada has gone to the bridal path. This is a fitting address for a house whose forms and materials push the norms of residential architecture. It's not a place for normal people who've done well. So that was the first thing that we learned is if you need a mortgage, it's not the neighborhood for you. You got to be able to go in with, you know, your tons of money, pay cash and want that sort of bling address. In fact, according to Norma, it's barely a neighborhood at all. We had four young children. They had no playmates on the street. There's nobody out raking. Nobody's playing basketball in their driveway. Every house has walls and fences around it. The people who live there want their privacy. They want to be left alone. The people who live on the bridal path may want to be left alone, but these are some of the most powerful elites in Canada. Their problems have a way of becoming problems for the rest of us. Cosetta Izzetti first arrived in Canada as a refugee from Albania 21 years ago. When we first came here, uh, I didn't speak English. I had a young son that was uh, 30 months old. I came with uh, my husband as well. And when we first came, we were told because we're refugee claim, they're like, you know, we didn't know anybody here, but they're like, oh, you know, you need to go to a shelter in order to sign in the country to get the papers. The first shelter she was able to get a spot in felt like it was in the middle of nowhere. And that was terrifying because it was outside, right on the on the highway, and then it was a hotel. They didn't have food or restaurant there, so we actually had to get on the highway to walk because it was so snowy to find a grocery store to buy groceries. But soon, she was able to find a spot somewhere much better, the Red Door Shelter which was a blessing for us because, first of all, the location where it was, there was a lot of Italian people around, and we spoke Italian. And it was December, so we had a roof over our head. It was terrifying, but yet thankful that when it was minus 40 outside, we had a roof. So that's how we started life in Canada. When her 13-month-old son came down with a vicious cold, the staff at the Red Door Shelter helped her navigate the situation. Like, he, he was so sick and he had such a fever. And I remember all night in the shelter crying and keeping him in a bathtub because of the, the fever he had. And I thought, oh my God, we came to give him a better life, but we're going to kill this kid here. Like, nobody's touching him to give him health care. And somebody from the Red Door Shelter that spoke Italian, she, just, she came to the room And I was sobbing and she's like, because I don't just dress him up and we're going to go somewhere and I'll never forget it. Like she took us in a taxi, brought us to a doctor. And if it wasn't for the Red Door Shelter, I I don't know what would have happened to my child. Cosetta and her husband were eventually able to find jobs and move out of the shelter. But since then, she's tried her best to give back to the Red Door. Every Christmas, I get like toys and donation, then we drop it with my kids. I wanted to show my kids where we started from. We actually always sing the song, we started from the bottom, now we're here. And and we're always put that in the car and it was our song. And our bottom was like at the shelter, even though I think it was the top where we started because it really showed us where to start from. So she was incredibly distressed when in 2014, the Red Door Shelter reached out to her. They were in trouble and at risk of closing. For decades, the Red Door Shelter has given a home for families who would otherwise have nowhere else to go. But now, many of those families could find themselves left out in the cold. And the person responsible for that was the real estate mogul you heard from at the top, Norma Walton. But let's back up for a minute. 
You'll remember that by the mid-2000s, Norma and her husband were running a successful Toronto real estate business, the Rose and Thistle Group. We were in Yorkville. We were on College Street. We had Front Street properties. We had Jarvis Street properties. We had Gerard Street properties. The, the core, like literally the core of Toronto, all of the old heritage buildings that you could see the potential and where everybody wanted to be. And at the time, there was a growing interest in the kinds of downtown commercial properties they dealt with. There's a coolness factor there that heritage real estate, you know, is second to none. We liked to buy old, dilapidated buildings with great bones and got renovate them. That was a specialty of ours. It's Toronto real estate, so business was inevitably good. But things went to another level when Norma Walton met Dr. Stanley Bernstein. Hi, I'm Dr. Bernstein, and let me tell you a little bit about our program. Whether you need to lose a few pounds or a few hundred pounds, we can help you lose weight and achieve your goal, take all the extra fat off, and do it on a very healthy basis. Dr. Bernstein is Toronto's most well-known diet doctor. There are around 50 Bernstein diet and health clinics across Canada. And he claims that if people follow his program properly, they can lose 10 pounds in a month. Walton and Bernstein met because he had a mortgage on one of the properties that they were working on. Because of the nature of their business, taking rundown real estate and fixing it up, Walton and her husband could sometimes have trouble accessing financing. This was happening at a time when the American mortgage market was melting down. So even Canadian banks had imposed stricter requirements on lending. So Walton went to Dr. Bernstein, and he agreed to privately provide them some money. They continued this arrangement for about three years, and then in 2010, the Waltons and Bernstein decided to deepen their relationship and become full-fledged business partners. This turned out to be a colossal mistake for both parties. Real estate's a high-stakes game, and should you do it under pressure? Absolutely not. The deal was that they would be 50-50 partners on every project, and both sides would provide equal amounts of money. The Rose and Thistle Group would handle the day-to-day business, but any transaction over $50,000 would require Bernstein's knowing approval. In short order, Bernstein had invested $110 million in 31 properties with Norma Walton's company. But there's one thing that Walton didn't know about her new partner, Dr. Bernstein. In the 1990s, he had been charged with enlisting a hitman to kill one of his business partners, and with having about $2 million of stolen watches and jewelry. Bernstein denied the accusations, and the charges were eventually dropped. And there's something that Bernstein didn't know about Walton. She was stealing millions of dollars from the business. She used the partnership money to pay off her own credit card bills and for taxes. And she purchased that luxurious mansion in the bridal path where she lived. Norma Walton told us that that was an investment property. We bought it to sever it and sell for profit, right? Because we were real estate people. Dr. Bernstein's accountant soon realized that something was up. He'd stopped receiving financial information from Walton's company. He tried to get accurate records from Norma, but she didn't provide them. Here's an email she sent Bernstein's accountant in response. Quote, We spend every hour of every weekday of every week of every month of every year ensuring that the portfolio is performing at or above pro forma. Unquote. It wasn't long before Bernstein's accountant discovered that Norma had bought the Bridal Path mansion where her family was living using partnership money. Bernstein sued, and that is where the Red Door Shelter comes back into the picture. The Red Door Shelter in Toronto's East End was one of the 31 properties that Walton and Bernstein had invested in. Walton wanted to renovate the building and flip it, and the shelter had helped the partnership get the property at an incredibly discounted rate because Walton had promised to provide them a new, larger location in return. They were excited about it. We were excited about it. It would have been dynamite. It would have been dynamite for the women at risk. It would have been dynamite for their kids. 
It was a perfect property because it gave them privacy. You were able to provide security. But the fight between Bernstein and Walton put even the original shelter, all 106 beds, at risk of shutting down forever. The problems facing the Red Door originate a world away here in the exclusive neighborhood of the Bridal Path near Lawrence and Bayview. A couple named Norma and Ron Walton owned the Red Door and 31 other properties. Last year, a judge ruled that Norma misused millions of dollars from their company, including close to $300,000, to renovate this home. The judge said it amounted to theft from their business partner, who was none other than the famous diet doctor Stanley Bernstein. When Cosetta Zetti heard that the shelter that had given her a home when she first moved to Canada was at risk of closing because of the machinations of rich people, she was devastated. I thought at the time that it was not fair that because of this accusing or like theft of money, you throw all these people on the street. Like it's not their fault that you did a bad business deal. I'm in business right now and... If I do a bad business, it's not my staff's fault to pay for it. Cosetta was one of the people who spoke out at a public meeting about the need to save the Red Door. It was very emotional and it was very, it was a lot of tension there. And I, I almost, even I wasn't there anymore, but I felt the pressure for that because, so I felt like these people are going to just be on the street, moved away from here. And Like, you could see the sadness. There was a lot of sadness in the room. Like, there was, like, tension and sadness at the same time. Though it came incredibly close, the Red Door was not forced to shut down. It's still around today, providing beds for people who need them. Norma Walton says she's still disappointed that her legal fight put the shelter at risk. She claims it was Bernstein's obstinacy that put it all in jeopardy. Norma Walton has always maintained that she never stole millions of dollars from the partnership. Instead, her lawyers have argued that this was a case of mismanagement, not criminality. Walton claims that she tried to make things right. My ex-partner, I offered to buy him out. I offered him all sorts of profits. He just wanted me bankrupt and in jail and and. When you're dealing with irrationality of any kind, terrible things happen and and it's baffling. It was it was truly baffling. The entire seven and a half years have been baffling. And the Red Door Shelter was a victim in that uh, litigation. And I certainly regret that we couldn't create the phenomenal facility that the shelter and I had had sort of envisioned and and were on the road to doing. But Dr. Bernstein disagrees. When we asked him for an interview, he sent us this response. Quote, You should speak to the police about Norma and the guilty charges against her. Also, check civil court theft findings. Dr. Bernstein won a lawsuit against Norma Walton for $66.9 million. And Norma Walton was criminally charged. She was convicted on two counts of theft and has been sentenced to three years in prison. I'm not at liberty to discuss the legal cases at all. Both the civil and the criminal are still ongoing. The civil case is still ongoing. It's almost done, I would hope. I always tease that, you know, receivers stay on until the last dollar has been spent, and then they go away. So we're we're almost to that last dollar, Arshi. So I'm hopeful that at some point in the next three months, it'll be completely done. She's currently on bail pending an appeal. I have spent 23 hours in jail. Today, Cosetta Zetti runs a successful salon in Toronto. And one of the most important things for her was buying the building her business is in. I felt grounded when I owned this because I almost felt like I was in a rent and in the beginning we couldn't afford, like some months we were short in money to pay the rent. And it was that fear of getting kicked out. And the moment that I had a few money on the side, I was like, I want a roof. I want to pay taxes for a property in this country that I feel I belong here. And having a roof over your head, you feel like belong. She says that now she's become more and more interested in real estate. 
and I'm a kind of a bit of obsession with properties now because we bought this and then I bought a house now so we have two properties and now I feel like I don't know like roof gives me security and it's it's very sad to take it away from somebody that is in a position that can protect themselves and as for Norma Walton while she appeals her criminal conviction she's working for her parents Currently, I am running a high-tech company that my folks own, and it's a lot of fun. And I also assist my parents with some of their land holdings. And until the legal stuff is over, that will likely be what I do. So I'm learning to love music apps and high-tech companies as opposed to fixing broken real estate. I asked her if she'd want to get back into the real estate business if she ever had the chance, in spite of all the trouble it's caused in her life. Norma was definitive. In a New York minute. Now, I was a bit surprised when Norma Walton agreed to talk to us for this story, so I asked her why. I think because you wanted to talk to me about real estate. <laughs> and I, it's a, again, it's I love it. I absolutely love it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that episode, subscribe to this channel. And also consider subscribing to our main channel to find exclusive videos and behind the scenes content that you can't get anywhere else. And finally, we're an audience supported network. So if you care about the work that we do, become a supporter. You'll get access to new ad free episodes, discounts on our merch, tickets to live events, and so much more. Just go to canadaland.com slash join.